In this lesson, we'll focus on the work of primatologists who study primates both in the wild and in captivity to help us understand primate behavior and social organization. In the video with Jane Goodall, it'll give you a sense of what it's like to do field research with wild primate populations. Primatologists study why and how primates are social. Living in a group requires a lot of social knowledge. Who's doing what to whom? How your actions fit in with this? Who you have to groom and when? in order to get along and make life easier. The larger the group, the greater number of relationships you have to keep track of. And since these relationships are constantly changing, as new members are born in and others leave to join other groups, you need still more intelligence to process it all. As primate societies grew more complex, so did their social intelligence. So the work of primatologists help us to understand the evolutionary processes that promote sociality. And since our earliest bipedal ancestors had a brain roughly the same size as a modern day chimpanzee, they were probably capable of the same types of behaviors, intelligence, communication, and social life that we observe among living primates. So the study of primate social organization and behavior therefore provides clues as to what early hominid behavior may have been like before culture. The majority of primates live in social groups, so there must be some advantage to this social structure. But we should also consider both the costs and the benefits to living in social groups. The advantages are outlined in this slide, but one of the disadvantages would be that the more members there are in the group, the more mouths there are to feed, which puts pressure on resources and can lead to violence, aggression, and competition from other groups and sometimes from within the group. So the long-term benefits of living together must outweigh the short-term disadvantages of having to share. Just as Jane Goodall had to learn how to identify individual chimps in order to figure out who was doing what to whom and when, so must a young primate learn to recognize different individuals within their group so that they can adjust their behavior appropriately to get along. This learning begins at birth, and since primate babies are completely dependent on their mothers for food, for protection, and transportation, it's during this stage of infant dependency that a strong, mother-infant bond is established, and indeed this is the longest, most enduring relationship in a primate's life. But during the stage of dependency, while the baby is being carried everywhere by its mother, the baby is exposed to a variety of social and physical situations. So social occurs early as the baby watches and learns how its mother behaves in various contexts and with various individuals within the social group. Specifically, the baby learns to interpret and understand the visual, auditory, and reproductive clues necessary to function within the group. As we've learned, primates rely heavily on their sense of vision, 
and the primary means by which they gather information about their surroundings, both physical and social, is through visual signals, and these visual signals provide information about the age, the sex, the reproductive status, and the rank of individuals in their own group or of other groups. Although this is not unique to primates, one of the ways that age is conveyed visually is through different coloration from infants and adults. So in some primate species, the coat color of baby primates differs from that of the adults, as you can see quite dramatically in the silver leaf monkey on the left, or in the facial coloring in characteristics of a young chimp versus the adult. What this does is communicates to other group members that these are vulnerable individuals within the social group and that a mother is likely to be very defensive, perhaps even aggressive in her behavior to protect her young. So it alerts others to approach with caution and not to appear threatening. Another way in which visual clues affect behavior is through indication of rank, as we see dramatically illustrated by the dominant male gorilla, who with his silver-colored hair on his back is known as the silverback. And this is a visual clue to members both within the group and outside of the group. For females and their young, they know who to turn to for protection and safety when threatened. And for males who are looking to establish their own reproductive rights within a group, they know who the leader is and who their challenger will have to be. Since so much of primate social behavior really revolves around opportunities to mate and to enhance reproductive success, we see visual and other clues develop that help to distinguish males and females within a species. This helps them to shore each other up and assess their chances for mating. Visual clues are also important for conveying information about an individual's reproductive status. This is important because mating behavior is determined in large part by the individual's desire or interest in maximizing his or her own reproductive success. And since females are only sexually receptive during their most fertile period, or estrus, there are visual and olfactory clues that advertise a female's fertility and ensures that mating occurs during her most fertile period. This is especially important for primates who give birth to one baby at a time. We left off in Lesson 10 with the visual signals that indicate reproductive status and why this is important for primates who give birth to only one baby at a time, ensuring that mating occurs during the female's most fertile period. One thing we need to keep in mind as we learn about primate behavior is that all behaviors observed in the wild are driven by immediate causes, hunger, fear, and the urge to mate. A host of behaviors related to increasing an individual's opportunity to mate are called reproductive strategies. That is, behaviors that are geared toward maximizing an individual's reproductive success. Now these strategies differ for males and females. For example, when females come into estrus, males are alerted by the sexual swellings that accompany it. And as males compete to mate with her, the quality of the female suitors is improved with essential effort from her. And thus, her mating preference influences the sexual selection of traits in the next generation. Another reproductive strategy is that females may choose to mate with more than one male at some point during her estrous cycle. 
This means that no individual male in her group can be sure who fathered the infant and consequently discourages infanticide, which we'll see why it's important in just a minute. So reproductive strategies of this sort give the female a measure of control over the males around her and reduces the risk of infanticide, thereby ensuring her own reproductive success. Male reproductive strategies can sometimes turn violent, such as with infanticide. That's not an uncommon practice among a number of monkey groups. And as a male reproductive strategy, infanticide seems counterproductive at the species level, since the males are essentially killing off a generation of members. But it illustrates just how individualistic these reproductive strategies are. They're aimed at increasing the individual's reproductive success. And they're not concerned with the outcome or the effect on the population as a whole. And this is illustrated quite dramatically by infanticide in the Hanuman Langer monkeys. Read through the slide notes below and then make sure to watch the clip at the bottom. Primate social organization and behavior is also characterized by dominance hierarchies. When two primates meet, they quickly establish which of them is stronger or more competent than the other. This may be settled by some kind of signal or a display or some physical struggle. The dominant individual will then gain priority access to food or to mates and the submissive animal will give way. Primates remember these interactions and soon learn their place in the local dominance hierarchy. All primates learn their position within the hierarchy, and in essence, the hierarchy helps to control behavior and impose a sense of order. It gets reinforced by a set of predictable behaviors, which, within the group, actually helps to reduce violence. Perhaps no other primate behavior is as time-consuming and indeed essential as the act of grooming, which is done for a number of reasons, but is primarily for the sake of physical contact and the closeness that it allows. Remember, primates are very tactile, and they thrive off of these tactile interactions with one another. On the surface, humans appear vastly different from the non-human primates. But really, 
The same behaviors that have been shaped by evolutionary forces of natural selection, sexual selection, to promote reproductive success and maximize the potential for survival among non-human primates are the same forces that shaped human ancestry, human anatomy, and perhaps aspects of human behavior. This is indeed a short list below, and most of these can be explained by very small genetic differences that put us on a different evolutionary path.